The Lord be with you. Thank you so much. This is the good news. Christ is risen. Good. Most of you still remember. This is the season of Easter. And so we continue to proclaim that good news that the one who came for us and lived our life faithfully and died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins has been raised. And he gathers us here as the baptized people, baptized into his name, that we might lift up our prayers and our praises. He gathers to give us a word on this day. He gathers us here trusting that his presence is with us in the Holy Spirit, and he sends us from this place today to be his witnesses in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. <laughs> That's where the disciples went. <laughs> you might go there too. What I meant is your Jerusalem, Timnath, Windsor, Fort Collins. <laughs> your Jerusalem, your Galilee, your Samaria. And so, friends, you are welcome in his name in this place. As we gather our hearts for worship, I would ask if there are any uh, announcements to be shared for the good of the community. Maureen. Our church is hosting a suicide um, awareness pro workshop on Wednesday the 25th. From five to nine, it's free, it includes dinner, but you must register, and we, they can only take up to 30. Right now we have the minimum, but we need at least five to 10 more people. So please see me. There's flyers uh, at the front and out here, but just come and talk to me. Dinner's included. Thank you, Lauren. Everett is, Everett is here, and he's almost six. Woohoo! Happy birthday, Everett, almost. <laughs> All right, seeing no other announcements, then let's prepare our minds and our hearts for worship this morning with the discipline of silence and with the ringing of the bell.
Thank you, Joan. Let all the earth resound with this song. Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Let's pray. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First hymn, number 108, Christ is Alive. Please stand if you're able. The risen Jesus said that repentance and forgiveness is to be proclaimed in his name to all. So let us repent and we hear God's grace and forgiveness for us once again. Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes, as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted your heavenly kingdom. In your mercy, forgive us.
This is the good news. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Believe the good news of the gospel. As God has given us peace in Christ, let us share that peace with each other. The peace of Christ be with you.
They are good, aren't they? Don't tell them I said that. I don't want their heads to swell. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Your spirit inspired the prophets and the writers of scripture. Your spirit draws us to Christ and helps us to know him as Lord. So send your Holy Spirit now that we may know the presence of your living God. Hear the good news for us and be raised with him to new life. Amen. The first reading will be in the New Testament, book of Revelations, chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. It can be found on page 248 in the Pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Singing with full voice, worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive the power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing. To the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. The word of the Lord. Time for the children's message. We can have the young and the young at heart come on up. Good morning. Glad to see you here. You know, when anybody in the pulpit says they're going to read out of Revelation, I kind of go, ah, oh, okay, I'll try to figure this out. But this one was pretty easy. They were praising God, weren't they? Praising Jesus as the Lamb, and, and it was really neat. Well, what I thought we'd do this morning is do the job that God gave us. Long in the Old Testament even, God said that one of our main jobs is to praise him. I think that might be the easiest job ever. Don't you think? Do you know what praise means? Anybody? Praise? Hmm. Yeah, well, praise means saying something really nice about somebody, doesn't it? Praise like... Um, if I were to say, Otto, you are terrific, which he naturally already knows, but <laughs> yes, then I'm praising Otto. So the way I like to praise God is I like to sing songs, right? And you might have noticed I was, yeah, singing with the choir and we were praising God. And so I thought maybe we'd sing a song together. And hopefully some of you know it. And we got actions, so you gotta get ready. You might wanna stand up, actually. We'll start standing up. It's called Rise and Shine and Give God the Glory. Have you heard a song like that? I have a backup choir here who's going to help me. We call them the pips. <laughs> So it goes, rise and shine. We're going to go stand up, and then we're going to go shine. Oops. Okay, shine and give God the glory. Can you do that? And then we're going to say it again. We're going to say, rise. So we stand up straight and shine and give God the glory. Glory, right? And then it's, we're going to say it again because three times is always good. But right in the middle of that one, we're going to sing, rise and shine and 
give God the glory, which is my favorite part of the whole song. So don't forget the stomp, right? Opal's got it down. Good job. I will praise her for her stomp. Okay. And then the last line of the song is, children of the Lord. And you can just put your arms out because what are we? We're all children of the Lord, right? I like it. Okay. And Bobby's going to help. Oh, oh, thank you, Bobby. Because <laughs> I'm about sung out. Okay. Okay, you ready? So you had to stand up first. So rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. Rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. Rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. Children of the Lord. Very good. You want to do it one more time? Or nah, no. <laughs> no? Okay, let's say a prayer then. <laughs> oh, well. Dear God, thank you for this terrific job you've given us of praising you and help us to know that we can just praise you in everything every day and show us, show us your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Just wait for the motions I have for you. <laughs> Christ is risen. He is risen and during the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus Christ presented himself alive by many convincing proofs, appearing to his disciples and teaching about the kingdom of God. So says Acts 1. And so the church has continued to believe that Jesus continues to present himself alive to us today, now in the power of his spirit, until we will see him face to face again, and he makes all things new. So during this Easter tide, this Easter season, we have been listening to stories of Jesus' resurrection appearances so that we might learn how to be attentive to his presence today. Last week, we saw Jesus where? Behind locked doors? Yes. With his disciples who were afraid, and he speaks a word of peace over them and sends them in the power of his spirit. But that is actually just part one of a two-part episode. The rest of the story goes like this. Listen carefully and listen well for God's word to us from the book we love. Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he answered them, unless I see the mark of the nail in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. 
Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and so that through believing, you may have life in his name. Friends, this is the word of the Lord, we say. Thanks be to God. Holy God, once again, in this season of Easter, we pray that you would raise our hearts into your presence, into that place of worship which we heard about in the text from Revelation that is always going on around your throne. That realist reality there is. Bring us there, Lord, so that as we hear these words of scripture and these words humbly spoken, we would in fact, through them, hear the voice of the living word Jesus and know his presence in our midst. We ask this together in his name and together we say, amen. Do not doubt, but believe. Those are the words, of course, that Jesus speaks to Thomas, do not doubt doubt, but believe. Maybe the words for Thomas are words for you this morning too. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas gets a bad rap, I think. I know some of you agree with me. Uh, Thomas is known, well, you can tell me, what's his nickname? Doubting Thomas, Thomas the Doubter, Disbelieving Thomas. In fact, just this week, last week, I was sitting with someone and mentioned this story, and before I could even read it with them, they said, ah, yes, Doubting Thomas. Thomas gets a bad rap. We know him only by his doubt, and we relate to him only on those terms, treating his name like a bit of dirty laundry that we don't want other people to see, I guess I'm a bit of a doubting Thomas in that regard. We say, Thomas, Thomas gets a bad rap. And I think that's a bad deal. I, I think that's unfair. Not because Thomas doesn't doubt, he does, but because A, all the disciples had doubt until they saw the Lord, and B, even in his doubt, Thomas teaches us something. I want to call him Thomas the teacher instead of Thomas the doubter. Even in his doubt, Thomas teaches us to remember something. In this story, Thomas teaches us something. Uh, Jesus then shows us something about himself and us, and you are offered something. Thomas teaches, Jesus shows you something, and you're offered something. First, Thomas teaches us something. Uh, it's verse 25. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. By which Thomas teaches us, or reminds us at least, that the resurrection is physical or it's nothing. When Thomas says, I want to see it, I want to touch him, even though that there, there's doubt in this, and we'll get there, he is also teaching us to remember that, that the resurrection better be physical or it is nothing. There's this old hymn, you might know some of the words to it, it goes like this, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. And here's the thing. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives 
within my heart. And you see, it's that that Thomas wants nothing to do with. If that's the only place Jesus is, Thomas says no thanks. Thomas will not be taken in by wishful thinking, and he will not be taken captive by some spiritualization of Jesus. So if when the disciples say, we've seen the Lord, they mean we've seen him in our heads, Thomas says, no thank you. If when they say he's alive, they mean only in our hearts, Thomas says, not for me. But if they actually mean we have seen him in the flesh, which is, of course, what they mean. We remember the story from last week. In that case, Thomas can be rebuked for doubting their testimony, but not for wanting to see Jesus alive in the flesh. Because the resurrection of Jesus is physical. It's bodily, or it's worth nothing. The resurrection of Christ has to be physical or it's nothing. That's what Thomas teaches us. Today in the modern world, there, uh, there is this tendency at times, I think, in the church to emphasize Jesus' resurrection in the body on Easter Sunday, surely, but on every other Sunday to sort of eh, spiritualize him, to just think about his effect on us to just think about his teaching, to just think about his personality that he had. And boy, couldn't we have a personality like that? Notice Thomas isn't thinking about any of that. Thomas is not thinking about the effect Jesus had on people. Thomas is not thinking about the teaching of Jesus. Thomas is thinking about the man, Jesus, whom he wants to see. And so to the creed that you stand and profess each week does not say, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus' hope, it says, I believe in the resurrection of the body, his and yours. Because what the gospel presents is not Jesus' effect, but Jesus alive in the flesh and with wounds to show for it. It's a different kind of fleshly body, for sure. He's suddenly showing up in rooms where the doors are shut because it's a resurrected body, not a resuscitated body. It's a glorified body, but still a body. Because the resurrection has got to be physical. It's got to be bodily. Or Paul says, what you believe is just silly. The um, theologian Karl Barth in the 20th century said it like this. He said, the New Testament tells us quite simply, do you want to believe in the living Christ? And it shows us that we may believe in him only if we believe in his corporeal resurrection for Life without a body is not human life. And that's the point. That's why this matters. Life without a body is not human life. And you see, what the God of the gospel wants is not disembodied souls in heaven. What God wants is human beings embodied, resurrected. What God wants is human beings, his creatures who have known sin and the oppression of death, overcoming it and resurrected. And in fact, the whole creation raised to new life. And Jesus, you see, is the first risen human. Jesus is, the New Testament says, the first fruit of that resurrection harvest. And his resurrection means that there is hope for the resurrection of your body and the raising up of this tired, wounded world. And what's more, because he is raised with his wounds still, they haven't disappeared. He shows that again and again. That means there is hope for your wounds to become not things that disappear and are forgotten in the by and by, but to become actually the very signs of God's victory over the sin, the injustice, the death that oppresses you and this world. Jesus shows the points of pain, no longer as points of pain, but as the points of where God has been at work. In fact, they become his testimony to the disciples. And in the same way, it may be perhaps for us, church, that the places of pain that we try to hide up can actually become the places we show and say, see, this is where God is at work in my life, making things new, bringing resurrection to me now with the promise of a greater resurrection yet to come. And we have that hope because Jesus is risen 
in the flesh. So even amidst his doubts, Thomas is a teacher. He is teaching us to remember that the resurrection has to be physical or it just is worth nothing. And indeed, Jesus comes to him and he says, put your hand here. Put your hand in my side. And he presents himself in the flesh to Thomas. And in that moment, Jesus shows us something. Well, first, Jesus shows us compassion. I mean, oh, think about the things he could have said to Thomas. You doubting Thomas, didn't I tell you that I would be raised on the third day? Where's your faith? I'll find another apostle. I mean, think about the things he could have said to Thomas. Didn't all your brothers, didn't the other disciples tell you they had seen me? Why don't you believe them? But is that what Jesus says to him? No. He says, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and touch my side. And then he prays for him. Do not doubt. Believe. In compassion, Jesus meets Thomas where he's at and prays for him to have faith which is what Jesus does for us. It is this moving moment, one of three very moving moments in the end of John's gospel. But this one, this, this one revealing the heart of the Father embodied in the compassion of Jesus for his friend. He shows compassion, but there's more. He also shows in this moment that faith is not first and foremost a matter of your efforts but his, Christ. Faith, I'll put it another way, belief is not a matter of your effort. As though you could just make it, oh, I'm going to believe now, I'm going to work really hard, and then I'll really believe. It's not a matter of your efforts. It is first and foremost a matter of Jesus' efforts for you. Effort is everything in our culture, or at least it's very important, right? If you want the new job venture that you're in to be working out, you better work really hard at it. If you want to get on the National Honor Society, you better have what it takes. If you want that person to notice you, you better have the right stuff, and obviously I don't. Um, if you want that new Peloton you bought to really be worth the price, you better be working out on it every day. You gotta give an effort, right? And there's something to be said of a good work ethic, and there's also something to be said of working ourselves to death, but one of the things we have to learn as Christians right in the beginning is that our faith in God, our belief, is first and foremost not a matter of our efforts, our working at it. It is first an encounter with Christ and his efforts. I mean, notice Thomas does not work at this, right? The disciples say, we've seen the Lord. Thomas says, I won't believe unless I see him and touch him. And then Thomas doesn't go looking for Jesus. Like, is he going to be at Beer Works on Wednesday? I'll go see if he's there. Is he going to get his groceries on Thursday? I'll meet him in the parking lot. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, if this is real, I'm going to go look for him. No. Jesus seeks Thomas. Jesus makes the first move toward Thomas. In fact, Jesus is the one who reaches out for Thomas. Here's my hand. It is not a matter of Thomas' effort that then sparks belief. It is Jesus seeking, reaching, that then and only then sparks this reply in Thomas, my Lord and my God, which is a confession of faith that every Christian has to make. My Lord and my God, you have met me here. You, you can't make faith happen. But Jesus wills us to believe and wants to encounter us so that we may respond like Thomas, even in the dance between doubt and faith. My Lord and my God. Jesus shows it's first his move. Now, I know some of you have been in seasons where it feels like you have been looking, pining, reaching for God, and it feels like you are grasping nothing. And that is a really hard place to be. It's an honest place to be when you confess it to others. 
It's a very familiar place to a lot of people in the Bible. In fact, most of the Psalms in the center of the Bible are laments saying, where are you, God? We trust you, but where are you? So you're in good company, but it's hard, and I don't discredit that. I do wonder, however, if in those moments when we are at the end of our rope for what we can believe, what we can do, how we can reach, that is the very place where Jesus is saying, good. Now, since you're at the end of your rope, you can, you can see what I've done. You can see my faithfulness for you. You can see the way I've reached for you. I do wonder if it's in that moment where it feels like, ah, we do, there's nothing left, that G, this fertile soil for Christ to then say, yes, and here I am. Look at the way that I have taken hold of your life and been crushed for your iniquity, been wounded for your sin, oh, been faithful for you because your faith wasn't enough. Here I am. If, if that is a moment when Jesus is inviting us to stop reaching and, in fact, to see the way that he has reached out for us first and is wanting to encounter us, perhaps in the simplest of ways, through the words of Scripture, through crusty bread broken, through the witness of those around you, saying he is alive when you can't say it, and singing worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and wealth and wisdom and might and glory forever. You can't make faith happen. Thomas doesn't. But Jesus wants you to believe. And he makes the first move. He comes to encounter you, church. He comes to meet you. So we need to ask, where is the risen Lord perhaps looking to encounter us? So that we might believe. And so that we might then receive the gift that he offers us. This is the last thing. Jesus offers a gift. Did you hear it? Jesus said to Thomas, this is verse 29, have you believed because you've seen me? And here's the gift. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Jesus offers a blessing. That's the gift. Who's that blessing intended for? It's not intended for any of the disciples who are listening to him because they've all seen the Lord. And now Thomas included. In fact, that's what makes them apostles. They are eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus. They go to tell so others can believe. So they carry this blessing with them, but it's not meant for them. The blessing is meant for people like you. Jesus, in John 20, verse 29, is offering a blessing to you, church. You who have not seen him, and yet, however fragilely this morning, believe in him. You who do not see him now, and yet love him and want to be with him. You who hope in his resurrection and hope in the raising up of all things new, Jesus calls you blessed. So that this week, as you, as you go to work, as you go to school, as you finish up school, perhaps, as you go shopping, as you go walking, the dance between faith and doubt, but faith and doubt, and hoping in the resurrection, you go as people who are blessed by the risen Christ. And so I wonder how his blessing will support you and comfort you this week until you hear his word for you again. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. I would invite you to stand in body or in spirit. One of the things that Christians have done for centuries in response to the word that 
meets us is to then confess our faith as Thomas did, my Lord and my God. So we do this morning with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Just as Jesus offers this kind of prayer for Thomas, do not doubt but believe, so Jesus continues to pray for us, and we enter into his prayer, lifting up our prayers in his name. So I would ask as we do that, if there are um, concerns or celebrations to be shared and prayed for in the community. Thank you for lifting up that prayer. For Buffalo, New York, for the killing of the 13 there, we go to God in prayer. O oh, Prince of Peace, you have spoken of a day when our swords will become plowshares, when our guns might be used as tools for agriculture instead of tools for death. And this morning, we aren't quite sure what else to say except hasten that day. And stir our hearts with courage and with action to do what we must to live into and toward that good future when the wounds of this world become signs of your victory. We pray this together, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Clarence. Okay, so for Clarence's friend Pete, whom we've been praying for for some months now. Jesus, we lift up into your hands, Pete. And we do pray that as you stretched out your hand to Thomas, you would stretch out the hand of your spirit to him, offering him comfort in this very difficult time, especially as he can't have other vis visitors. Lord, visit him with your presence and make him aware of it and give him strength in his spirit. Together we pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Bobby? We pray for our hearts as well. Yeah. Prayer of thanks for all these beautiful young children in our congregation. Hmm. We're very, very blessed to have these children here as a hope for the future. And also, prayer for our pastors. We have a big 
challenge to do. We must look into our our own hearts mm. for where where we can heal these wounds and help our our younger members here too. Yeah. So we pray for we give thanks for our children. We also pray for those adults, pastors included, who nurture, raise them um, to walk in the way of the Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the one who said, let the little children come to me, and you delighted in their presence and taught us to notice how they see the joy of the kingdom, perhaps when we cannot and have the spirit about them that we need. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you for their presence here. We thank you um, for so many young people, all of them in our, in our country, in our nation, in the world. We also um, pray, as Mike did, for, uh, for us who are older, who are called to nurture them, um, to teach them to walk in your way, uh, to teach them the things of peace that you have given to us. And so we ask for the ingenuity to do that, for the wisdom to do that, for the courage to do that, for the patience to do that. And we ask that you would give us that through your spirit. Together we pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Nancy. Yeah. For Don and Nancy's granddaughter who just graduated from nursing school and for all the graduates at this time of year, um, we lift them up in prayer. Lord, in your resurrection, you opened up a new future which we could not have imagined. One in which this world is the place um, that you will not throw away, but you will redeem. And so we lift up our graduates as they walk toward that future now. Um, whether it be in nursing or in so many different degrees that they may have required or skills that they have learned, um, we pray that they would use those gifts that they have received for the good of your world, and that you would give them signs of your hope to lead their way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And let's continue to pray together for our world and for our town and for one another. Father, in this Easter season, we come continuing to lift up hope-filled prayers in the name and spirit of Christ. And we pray for this world. Once again, as you spoke peace to your troubled disciples, so we do pray for your peace in our world. We pray for your peace to strengthen Russians and Ukrainians surrounded by tragedy. We pray for your peace in the hearts of those making difficult decisions for our country. We pray for your peace to comfort the friend we know experiencing loss. We pray for your peace amidst the families of those in New York, we pray for your peace and the peace of your presence with us, even here, Lord. Together we pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers, our prayers for our city, the town of Timnath, and all who live or work here. All power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing belong to Jesus, your Son, our Lord, and therefore, Father, we pray that his Spirit would direct our reception of these things here, so that those in power here might use their influence for good, so our wealth here might be distributed in a way that blesses many, so our children here at Timnath Elementary in Bethke, Windsor Charter, and Fossil Ridge would inherit wisdom and walk in it, so that our might as neighbors might be known in our gentleness, so those considered least and last would be honored, and so that in all this you would be glorified through the flourishing of this community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers, our prayers for the church. As the disciples testified to the risen Lord, saying, we have seen him, so you make us witnesses to his cross and resurrection. Give us humility and courage for this calling, so that others would see and hear the good news among us and believe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers, our prayers for one another. We thank you, Father, for this fellowship of believers. We thank you 
for the life we share and the way we can walk with one another in faith and through our doubts. And we ask that as we walk together here through pain, we would find healing in the wounds of Christ. As we walk through any confusion, we would find hope in the words of Christ. And that in all times and seasons, we would indeed find life in his name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We ask these things trusting that you do indeed hear. For we pray in the name and spirit of Christ, who gathers up all things in himself, and who taught us to gather up our prayers, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As God has given us life in Christ, so we give our lives back to the Lord in service. And our offering is a sign of that. So we take our morning offering. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, and of your own have we given you. Thank you. Receive these gifts. Amen.
or it's nothing. And because it's physical, we use our bodies for our charge and our blessing. During the first three lines, lifting our hands to the cross, and the last one, lifting them to heaven. So would you join me? All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. All our hopes we set on the risen Christ. And may Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve.